of Wilmington College in Southwest Ohio in Wilmington, Ohio. Welcome back to the 30th annual Westheimer Peace Symposium focusing on peace and the nature of war through a special two-day symposium entitled The Nuclear Threat, Past, Present, and Future in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan by the United States. This year's symposium is a special collaboration with the Wilmington College Peace Resource Center, which holds an extensive collection of archival materials related to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the human experience of nuclear war. It is also held in collaboration with the Response Project, funded by an Ohio Arts Council grant created by Brianna Matsky, pianist, concert pianist, and music faculty at Wilmington College. The response project brings together seven artists from across the United States who have created original compositions for the symposium in response to archival materials from the Peace Resource Center archives. For a full schedule of today's lectures and performances, please go to wilmington.edu backslash Westheimer. My name is Tanya Moss and I'm your host for this afternoon's plenary lecture entitled The Art of Storytelling Hibaksha Testimony and Artful Action for Disarmament. In my role as host, I'm here to welcome you, briefly introduce the, the speaker, and be on hand to help field questions and comments as needed. A warm welcome to our plenary speaker today, Kathleen Sullivan. Dr. Sullivan has been engaged in the nuclear issue for more than 30 years, director of Hibaksha Stories, an arts-based initiative that has brought atomic bomb survivors to some 45,000 students she produces nuclear themed films, including two documentaries, The Last Atomic Bomb and The Ultimate Wish, Ending the Nuclear Age, and projects that focus on art for disarmament, utilizing visual arts, music, and dance. The Nuclear Age in Six Movements and the Hiroshima Panels Project, and If You Love This Planet, are among those. Kathleen is a founding member of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, the 2017 Nobel Peace Laureate, having produced ICANN's early education material for high school and early college students. She has been appointed by the current city mayors as a Nagasaki peace correspondent and a Hiroshima peace ambassador. Kathleen, welcome and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much. I'm so moved and inspired by all of the um, brilliant work that I've seen. Um, the Artist Response Project has been phenomenal. Um, learning from friends and new colleagues over these last two days has been so inspiring. Uh, what I propose to do is to show some slides of the work that we've done through Hibaksha Stories and um, kind of tell a little bit about what we have done and how we have been using the arts to bring people to greater awareness around the nuclear threat. And um, then I'd love to hear any questions and comments that you have. So what I'm gonna do is uh, share my screen. Um, so bear with me for a second. And let's see. Um, I hope this is working. Let's see. Okay, I do believe that that is working. Yep, we can see everything, Kathleen. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to um, mute my video. Is that okay there? Yep. Great, okay, I will begin. Um, I'd like to dedicate my um, remarks today to our beloved sister, Ardith Platty. Um, Ardith died on Wednesday of this week, peacefully in her sleep at the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker House in Washington, DC. Ardith was a tireless activist for nuclear disarmament. She was part of the Plowshares community of nonviolent direct action. In 2002, with her dear friend, sister Carol Gilbert, and Sister Jackie Hudson, she entered a Minuteman III missile silo, a nuclear missile silo in Colorado, where they poured their own blood on the missile silo. They were convicted of federal felony charges and sentenced to prison. Uh, this wasn't a first for Ardith or Carol who have spent their lives working for peace and social justice. Life is so precious. 
What an honor to have befriended this extraordinary woman. I will always remember artist's passion, conviction, and sense of fun. Thank you so much, beloved artist. Oh, let's see. Okay, to begin. Um, we're going to be speaking today about the art of storytelling and, um, you know, looking at how memories are so much a part of who we are, just sharing a few memories of our beloved artist, and also thinking about how we transmit Hibaksha testimony for present and future generations and keeping the memories and stories alive is a very, very uh, crucial factor. Um, in my presentation, I would like to share thoughts on using the arts as an effective means to learn and propagate Hibaksha testimony to keep their memories and motivations alive to motivate our own work for the total elimination of nuclear weapons or however we show up to make our world a better place. Um, again, I'd just like to add before, oopsie, before my um, formal uh, presentation, how much I've been inspired by the first response commission's uh, original work. Um, and I really look forward to collaborating um, with artists who have been involved in this project. So um, Hibaksha Stories is an initiative of Youth Arts New York, a non-governmental organization um, with a memorandum of understanding uh, with the United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs. Our mission is to provide experiences in the arts, sciences, and civil society that engage youth in building a peaceful and sustainable future. We sponsor in-class educational programs, after-school workshops led by master artists, hands-on ecological projects, and field trips. We create safe environments where underserved New York City public school students can learn about their responsibilities as peacemakers. Um, we really bring the uh, atomic bomb survivor story to life. And here you can see some of that love um, that is shared amongst the students and survivors. This is Setsuko Thurlow, who may be familiar to many of you. Um, over the last years, we have brought more than 100 atomic bomb survivors to more than 45,000 high school students. Um, so I'd just like to introduce you to a few of these friends who have inspired art education and activism um, of Hibaksha stories. So this is um, Setsuko. She was um, 13 years old when the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki. She was um, saved by a, um, who she believed to be a Japanese soldier. Um, she has, dedicated her life to disarmament and um, she's been one of the leading advocates of um, the work that we've done through the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and ICANN and we'll hear more from Setsuko. This is Sakue Shimohira. She was 10 years old um, when the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki. She is one of the uh, Hibaksha orphans um, she lost her parents in the blast. She lived as an orphan in the streets of Nagasaki for years with her sister, who later succumbed to um, suicide. That, that, that's something that, that many Hibaksha chose that path. And I think it's very important to recognize that most Hibaksha do not share their testimony. It's just too painful. Um, I met Shimohira-san through uh, the city of Nagasaki when I was invited there in 2002. Uh, we have remained friends since that time. This is Awada-san who many of you heard his story through Susan Southard's presentation yesterday. An extraordinary man, he was a train car conductor at the time. Um, and he later came to telling his story um, as a survivor. Um, and he told me that he was prompted to share his story when he saw his first grandchild. And, you know, he, he had this sense of that this grandchild's life was in danger and he had to unearth his um, painful memories and share for the future of the planet. 
um, for those grandchildren all over the world. This is Reiko Yamada. She was 11 years old in Hiroshima and um, she survived the blast. She, like Setsuko, has dedicated her life to sharing her story. Um, and she's been a very important part of our Hibaksha project. This is Reiko with uh, Shigeko Sasamori. Um, and she is, Shigeko and Reiko are standing on the High Line in Chelsea um, in Manhattan. Behind them is the Baker and Williams warehouse where thousands of tons of uh, uranium was stored for the Manhattan Project. Uh, many people do not recognize that there were sites throughout New York City which stored uranium for the Manhattan Project and also the Manhattan Project Engineering District. Um, Manhattan played a huge role in the development of nuclear weapons. The um, warehouses behind uh, Reiko and Shigeko were not fully remediated until the late 80s, early 90s. Um, this is Shigeko Sasamori again. Shigeko was 13 years old in Hiroshima on um, August 6th. She remembers looking up in the sky and seeing an airplane. Uh, she was outside, unlike Setsuko, she was outside and was severely burned by the explosion. Uh, she would later come to New York City in 1955 as part of the Hiroshima Maidens Project, which was set up by um, Norman Cousins to bring young women from Hiroshima for reconstructive plastic surgery. Um, Shigeko had more than 30 operations to separate her chin from her chest, which was her chin was fused to her chest um, because of the heat of the blast. Uh, she is an extraordinary woman, continues to share her testimony. Here is uh, Shigeko um, when our project went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and in the background, you see um, Pam Kingfisher. Um, Pam is a Cherokee woman who has been very involved in um, anti-nuclear work. Uh, her father um, worked at Hanford, um, the Hanford Reservation um, in Richland, Washington. And this is Yasuaki Yamashita. He was a boy, a seven-year-old boy in Nagasaki um, on August 9th, 1945. Normally, he would have been playing in the mountains uh, with his friends, but he was at home when the atomic bomb destroyed the city of Nagasaki, and his mother saved his life by covering him with her body. Um, Yasuaki was uh, later um, a worker at the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Hospital, and it was there that he was overcome with the sensation that he too could have a tragic death from exposure to radiation because he saw people die many years after the atomic bomb had exploded in Nagasaki. He moved to Mexico in 1968 um, where he lived as an artist. Uh, he, he's a ceramicist and a painter. And he did not come to share his testimony until many years later. Um, but today he is part of the uh, community of Hibaksha who share their testimony to, um, and I wanna say this very clearly, um, risk their own comfort to share their story so that others will not have to suffer the same fate as them. Um, because we can all identify with what it means to share something that's very painful for us. Um, so, you know, it's not a comfortable story to hear. It's certainly a much less comfortable story for people to remember, imagine, and describe. Um, not only do we bring atomic bomb survivors into the classrooms, and this is where we're talking about the art of storytelling, but we also work uh, with the United Nations. This is Yasuaki-san sharing his testimony with um, UN guides. You know, UN guides, they're the public face of the United Nations. And by organizing testimony sessions for UN guides, 
they're able to hear the firsthand witness and then infuse what they share with the guests from all over the world that come to the United Nations. Um, so this has been a very special part of our project. We've also been involved in um, organizing side events. Um, this is Setsuko Thurlow speaking at a side event we um, organized with the government of Japan and the UN Office on Disarmament Affairs um, during the NPT Review Conference in 2015, um, and really presencing the Hibakusha and their testimony. Um, this is another event that we had at the UN with uh, Setsuko and Yasuaki, also with um, Michi uh, and Miyako, who are second generation. Uh, Michi Takeuchi, second generation Hibakusha from Hiroshima, and Miyako Taguchi, a second generation Hibakusha from Nagasaki, and bringing their voices um, to be the next storytellers to share. Um, the reality of what happened on August 6th and 9th in 1945, and what continues to affect people to this day, um, the invisible poison of radiation. So our work is most enjoyable, most heartfelt in the classroom with the students. And I would say through this art of storytelling, um, the Hibaksha have connected with tens of thousands of young people, mostly in New York City. And um, the students really get a feel for the person that is bringing history to life and also for the power of that witness and what they can learn and how they can be inspired to uh, join the work in making our world a better, more secure place. This is uh, Shigeko and Yasuaki on a relatively recent trip uh, to a high school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Another way that we um, engage the students is by um, working with playwrights in New York City to bring young people into playwriting sessions with atomic bomb survivors. Um, the let's see where we see um, Reiko uh, Yamada would have been sharing her testimony um, in this session with students um, from uh, New York City High School. So basically what they would do is they would listen intensely to testimony. Then they would hear from um, a resident playwright about you know the different principles of playwriting and um, conveying narrative. Uh, and then they would be able to ask questions of the atomic bomb survivors. Then they'd go away, work in small groups, um, share a Japanese lunch with each other, you know, bringing the cultural aspects into the performativity. And then the afternoon would be spent uh, sharing their one act plays. And this was just enormously impactful for the students and also the atomic bomb survivors who we, we brought into this project. Um, we also engage students in the Japanese art of kamishibai. This is a picture book of storytelling. Um, these are uh, drawings of students in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is the story of Shigeko. Um, where she says she looked up in the sky and she said she saw the airplane, it's flashing silver and white. And she said to her friend standing next to her, look, look at the airplane up in the sky. And within that millisecond later, oh, she said she saw a white thing coming down. Well, that was the sort of parachute of the, the bomb coming down over Hiroshima. And um, then she was terribly burned, knocked back unconscious. Um, this is another drawing from um, one of the students in Tulsa. And this is a drawing of another Tulsa student who is sharing the story of uh, Yasuaki that he, he, he said, normally he would go to the uh, mountainside and catch cicadas and dragonflies. But for that, for some reason that day on August 9th, uh, he stayed by his mother's side. And unfortunately for those friends who did go to the mountainside, um, many of them were um, burned to death and did not survive. 
This is just another image of the students. And, you know, after listening to such a very difficult story and then being able to share um, their comments and questions, just the feeling of love and connection that they have with the uh, atomic bomb survivors is something to really behold. Another way that we bring um, art to the work for disarmament is through animations. Um, the Nuclear Age and Six Movements you can find online. It's a short film animated by Amber Cooper Davies, who is a London-based uh, artist with music composed by Sam Sadagursky. Um, Sam is an award-winning um, musician, multi-instrumentalist and composer who lives in New York City. Um, he was part of the, the band's visit, which won something like 11 Tonys. Um, and he's been one of our muses that has lent his talents uh, to our project since, um, since, 20, since 2010. We've been working with Sam. Um, this is a still from another animation that Amber uh, made for us, uh, which is called If You Love This Planet. Again, you can find these online or on the ICANN website. Um, if You Love This Planet is an animation of Setsuko Thurlow's closing words, um, the day, July 7th, 2017, that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was adopted at the United Nations. Uh, Setsuko was given the final word by the um, chair of the, of the conference. And uh, when she finished, every person in that room rose to their feet in total admiration for Setsuko, a force of nature and a force of good for our shared work for the elimination of nuclear weapons. It's another still from Amber's animation. Um, Amber came to us through a um, concert that was really the, the heart brain child of my beloved and dear collaborator, Robert Kroonquist, which was a concert that we organized to coincide with the um, 2015 NPT review conference called With Love to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was an extraordinary event. Um, over 600 people attended. Um, and I just wanna say here before I get on to the, the, the characters that attended with us or the people that attended with us was that um, unique to this um, location uh, was that it was at the New York Society for Ethical Culture. Um, 600 people attended. New York Society for Ethical Culture was um, in part founded by or very much presenced by in its early days, the Oppenheimer family. So we were in a building where Robert Oppenheimer um, would have spent time as a child. And we brought their um, art and um, people, poetry, music, this is Truman Clifton Daniel. He's a uh, part of our Hibakusha Stories project. He's the eldest grandchild of Harry Truman. And he presided over the uh, concert. Um, this is um, uh, the mayor of Nagasaki, um, Mayor Toe, who also lent his, his voice and words. Um, here is Yasuaki-san speaking about um, Something that when you're in New York, when we can next travel and be together, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, there is this very large Shinran Shonin statue um, that was gifted to New York City in 1955 by the city of Hiroshima um, as an act of friendship. Uh, and this statue survived the atomic bomb. So it was just a kind of reflection for Yasuaki-san, who is an Nagasaki survivor, as an artist, looking at the statue that was given to the city of New York um, so many years ago. Here's Setsuko using um, a banner that was made for her by her um, girls school, Jogakuin um, School for Girls in Hiroshima, where 351 of her classmates um, were murdered 
by the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Setsuko often travels with this banner, which has the name of each one of those students. Again, using visuals to, to convey uh, something larger than what words can convey. Really, Hibakusha are the only ones that can describe what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but at the same time, it's really beyond words what they, what they witnessed. Um, it, it's, it's unspeakable, it is undescribable. Um, here is a way that Setsuko uses to uh, share um, that tragedy. Um, likewise, uh, Shigeko here speaking with Clifton, they have become friends. Um, they have a really uncanny, um, extraordinary friendship between the two of them. And during the concert, they are reflecting on that. Um, we were also very privileged to um, have the uh, Hibaku violin. Um, this is being played by a concert uh, master um, from, uh, Hiro uh, from Japan, um, whose name is escaping me at the moment. Oh, Masaki Tanokura, Masaki Tanokura, who is the concert master of the Osaka Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, he was accompanied here by his wife, Tomoko Sawada, on the piano. But this is the Jogakuin Hibaku violin. Um, our dear friend Michi Takeuchi was the one that um, made the, this happen. Um, this violin survived the atomic bombing. There are uh, several instruments, pianos um, and this violin and others that survived the atomic bombing and um, they've been restored and they are played in concerts around the world as symbols of peace. Part of the concert that was most moving to me was the Himawadi All Hibaksha Choir. These are uh, atomic bomb survivors from Nagasaki who traveled to New York to perform for us. Um, they performed their own compositions, but they also performed a composition um, by Jean Rowe, who you see here. Uh, Jean is a singer songwriter from the New York metro area. And um, she composed an anthem for nuclear guardianship. And what was just very moving about this is that the Himawadi Choir was joined by LaGuardia High School Choir. Um, LaGuardia High School for the Performing Arts is the fame school that that once television show was modeled after. These very talented young vocalists joined with the Hibaksha to sing an anthem that was composed for our concert by Jean Rowe. And um, there was singing, there was also speaking. Here you see a young man from LaGuardia High School and he's intoning here, um, the anthem is about a, a presencing of future generations to bring us a message. And he's saying, you know, remember when we all sang together and we lifted our voices with one another. I watched this clip recently and it was just so moving to think about it, you know, in this time of not travel, not singing, not making music in public. Um, it, I, it was, it, I was moved to tears. Uh, here again, students and Hibaksha, even though many of the Hibaksha um, in the Himawadi choir do not speak English and the students from LaGuardia High School do not speak Japanese, they were able to clearly communicate through art and music. It was a really extraordinary and touching um, concert and evening. And I, I, we, we brought together many other artists. It's, it's one of the projects that's um, on my bucket list. I've got all the footage and someday we're gonna make a, con a, a, a short film of the concert so that we can, we can share it with you all. Um, so not only music and animation, kamishibai, we've also had the privilege of working in the fine arts. Um, Hibaksha Stories was part of a collaboration with Pioneer Works, um, a gallery and um, art and innovation space in Brooklyn, New York, 
to bring the Hiroshima panels to the United States as part of a limited tour. And um, these works are really Japan's Guernica. I mean, they are so profoundly important and so profoundly underappreciated. Um, they are made by the artists um, Iri and Toshi Maruki, a husband and wife team, who over a 32 year period painted these Hiroshima panels. They are, they are truly unique and unprecedented in all the world. Um, they've been exhibited extensively throughout Japan and Europe, but they've all, only made a very few appearances um, in the United States. So as part of our um, honoring of the 70th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we brought the uh, Hiroshima panels to um, Pioneer Works. Um, we also not only had them for the public, um, so Pioneer Works is a public institution and um, many members of the public were able to come and see the Hiroshima panels but we also brought in um, groups of students. We had workshops with uh, students to be able to hear Hibaksha testimony, to reflect on the art, and then to write a piece, a poem, a, some kind of performance, so that we um, were able to bring all of these different elements together, um, much like the uh, theater workshops. So also in the gallery at um, Pioneer Works, uh, I was given some um, atomic bomb artifacts by um, Sakuishi Mohira in Nagasaki. Um, these are bits of melted glass. You can see in the background is a um, old ink bottle or medicine bottle. Uh, this is particularly eerie because if you hold this bottle, um, you, it's almost like it was melting in a human hand. Um, these are ways, again, that we can find to bring this work to life. Um, this, this unspeakable reality of nu the nuclear threat then and now um, without using words, but with using um, artifacts and art. So in the gallery, we also had the artifacts and after hearing Hibaksha testimony, after, after witnessing with the panels, um, the students provided their own performances. And then uh, Setsuko and Yasuaki, who were at this particular workshop, were able to share their feedback as well. And here's our one of our groups of students that we brought through Pioneer Works through Hibaksha Stories. Um, this was especially moving to use fine arts and also to draw more public awareness to uh, the Hiroshima panels. Um, in the year that this was on display in Brooklyn, um, the Pioneer Works Hiroshima Panels Art Exhibit was voted the second best art exhibit um, in the borough of Brooklyn for 2015. And I think it was uh, Michelle Basquiat that got the uh, first place at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, while we had the Hiroshima panels at Pioneer Works, we also worked with Guggenheim Fellow, um, Eiko Otake, an extraordinary woman, amazing dancer. Um, and one of the uh, things that we did was we had and an opportunity for Eiko to dance to the panels. Um, so bringing the fine art of the Hiroshima panels together with Eiko, um, dancing in a performance to the panels, kind of bringing the panels um, that much more to life uh, was just, I can't really describe what it was like. It was again, bringing these unspeakable horrors into some sharp relief through art and performance. And what we did with this is we filmed um, Eiko dancing in front of the panels. And then a year later, we worked with um, some very beloved jazz artists in New York City. Um, there at the piano is Dan Tepfer. Um, and 
in this other scene, we have Meg Okura. And again, Sam Sadigursky, um, one of our muses. And they improvised to a film that was made by Cynthia Medansky, um, uh, who has won the MacArthur Fellowship and many other, also a Guggenheim. Um, she's an extraordinary filmmaker and artist. And I believe right now we've got a little clip of that um, to show you. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and mute you, and then I will bring you back afterward. Thank you. Okay, yep. It looks like we might have lost Kathleen for just a minute uh, in terms of her sound. Um, let's see if we can get the sound back up. Um, Kathleen, I see you also are wondering about sound. Yeah. Oh, we got you back. Okay, I'm gonna get out of here and let you continue to talk. Oh, okay. I was just looking forward to that film clip, but it oh, does have okay. sound. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hang on I'm just sorry. a second. It, on our side. Yeah. No it was set up incorrectly. Let me try that again. Let's try one more time. <laughs> no worries. Thank you.
Okay. Oh, hi. So I just want to go back to my screen share. Um, so that just gives you an idea of just the sort of power of art. And um, what happened there was, you see the students now in this image. Um, there were 100 students. This is at um, National Sawdust, which is a, a performance space in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, the students in the audience are performing arts students. So they're very already very interested in the arts. And um, they listened first to Hibaksha testimony. They then saw Cynthia's 12 minute film, which you just saw a clip of. And to begin, we had Sam Sadagursky and Meg Okura improvising to the film. So they're emoting, they're using their own, you know, brilliance to um, improvise in that moment to the film. Um, Sam on bass clarinet and Meg, uh, as you can hear on the violin. Um, we played the film again and Dan Tepfer uh, improvised on the piano um, using all kinds of parts of the piano, including the strings exposed in that grand piano so that the students could get a different feel for the different improvisations that were offered by the musicians. And after that, Aiko came out live and talked to them about her performance. And she performed and then she kind of broke the third wall and then, and then talked to them about um, performativity. So they were learning as performance art students. They were also um, learning about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, you know, and the main point of our Hibakusha Stories project is to bring, the United States has a, generally about two pages on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a standard textbook, how to bring this to young people's hearts and minds so that they understand that we still are very much a world under threat and to bring to their awareness that there's something that we can do. So here is Eiko performing and then explaining, you know, about what she did and why. It was just an extraordinarily moving day. Um, we partnered with Peace Boat uh, who brought 10 different atomic bomb survivors to share their testimony. So, you know, that's, that's another fine art way. Um, and just a huge privilege, I will again um, sort of embarrassingly note that um, I've got a can full of um, footage and sound from the National Sawdust Project, which we hope we will be making um, into a short film to share with everybody. This is, um, just, this is just a few of the films that I've made, The Last Atomic Bomb. Um, can't believe it, that was for the 2005 anniversary, the 2005 um, 65th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Later, um, again with Robert Richter, I made the film The Ultimate Wish, Ending the Nuclear Age. This connects Nagasaki atomic bomb survivors with Fukushima um, radiation refugees. Um, this is something that we really wanted to make a connection between nuclear weapons and nuclear power. Sadly, like the Hibaksha in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, many people in Fukushima experience um, intense discrimination because of this false notion that radiation sickness is somehow contagious um, or that there's you know, something that can be got from and um, people still suffer that stigmatization, not only in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also now from uh, the continuing radiological catastrophe that was the triple meltdown in Fukushima. I also like to give a shout out to my special um, friend, dear collaborator, Susan Southard, who we heard from yesterday um, in the art of storytelling as writing. Um, Susan here is um, at the United Nations delivering ICANN statement on the UN day of the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, I've really, take my hat off to Susan for many, many reasons. So she's such a, an incredible writer, 
an extraordinary person. She's also very involved in the arts through a theater project that she had founded um, and dedicated an enormous amount of time and creativity to over many years. Um, but she uplifts the story of Nagasaki. I think that is so important. Um, people generally look at the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and we kind of stay with what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki is kind of an afterthought. Um, Nagasaki, in terms of, if I could be so crass as to say US strategy, um, the plutonium instrument of genocide that leveled the city of Nagasaki is what would become the component to all US hydrogen bombs. Susan tells the story of Hibakusha, not only what happened at the moment, because again, we kind of think of things as on August 6th and August 9th in 1945, and then sort of like that happened, but it continues to affect people to this day. And she was brilliantly able to uh, convey that. And I finally, I just like to say a few words about the art of diplomacy. Um, you know, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is gathering steam. We have uh, 46 uh, ratifications. Um, we need 50 to enter the treaty into force. Um, the treaty um, names, recognizes Hibakusha by name. Um, that's very, very uh, important to, to the atomic bomb survivors. Um, there's many things that we can say about the treaty. I imagine that um, my friend Carlos is going to be discussing that in his uh, lecture later today so that I will leave it to him. But you know, there is really an art to diplomacy. And I would say that um, our dear colleagues and I can um, mastered that in the work between civil society and governments. Um, and for our work on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, um, we won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, here Setsuko is making her final preparations before representing all Hibaksha in her Nobel lecture on behalf of our campaign. That was a really amazing thing that happened. And, you know, like anybody um, in our campaign, I just would like to say every person that's a part of the symposium, every person who has ever worked for the abolition of nuclear weapon, pa weapons, past, present, and future, is a part of this Nobel Peace Prize. This Nobel Peace Prize belongs to all of us. Um, I've been using a lot of photos in my presentation um, by pho photographers who have dedicated their time and energy to nuclear abolition. Um, one of those photographers is pictured here, Robert Kroonquist, holding the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, also Ari Beezer, Paule Saviano, Janice Lewin. Um, there are many photos um, from the At Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum and the uh, Hiroshima Museum and the archives at Wilmington College um, that can inform people about the reality of what happened um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the art of photography. This incredibly moving um, picture was um, the holy card of Pope Francis two years ago, which he called the fruits of war. Um, there are very few people outside of Nagasaki, perhaps, but maybe more are be beginning to understand this, that um, will understand that in 1945, the largest population of Catholics in all of Asia was Nagasaki, was ground zero of the world's first plutonium bomb. Um, obscenely codenamed Fat Man, the bomb incinerated the city and um, 70,000 people primarily, of course, that we know women, children and elderly were murdered. And um, this was by the harnessing of the most fundamental binding force of the universe and tearing it apart to unleash a radioactive hellfire. The German poet Rainer Maria Rolka said, no feeling is final from the unexplainable, unimagin unimaginable suffering of the Hibakusha to their inspiration, their motivation and action for the world without nuclear weapons, a world without war is perhaps the greatest example of all arts, the art of love and the art of cultivation. 
Um, and so, so we, we end and we begin here with love. Uh, this is a photo by Ari Beezer of the Nobel concert um, when we won the Nobel Peace Prize. That's John Legend that you can barely see under a little bit between the V and the E. He's playing a Hibaku piano, um, an atomic bomb surviving piano that Hibaksha stories played a big role in bringing from Hiroshima to Oslo um, so that John Legend could play that piano. Um, and I, I love that we have this image um, with the Hibaku piano, um, using that as an instrument of, of peace. And um, I just want to, to sort of finish here, um, and then I've got one short video clip. Um, but just to say that everything and everyone we love, everything and everyone we love is threatened by the existence of nuclear weapons at every moment of every day. One of the great things that the arts do is they move us from a place of abstraction to a personal place, to a place where we can reflect personally. And, um, you know, I think that one of the great um, achievements of the uh, of ICANN and of anti-nuclear campaigners all over the world is to say, this isn't an abstraction, this is personal, this is personal to me because everything and everyone we love is threatened by the existence of nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons that are on hair trigger alert at this moment, hemmed to earth by human beings who make mistakes, by machines that we have built that will eventually break. So as we work for our goal, our shared goal for the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Let us do this work buoyed and inspired by everything and everyone we love. Not what we fear, but what we love will motivate us to bring a world where nuclear weapons uh, no longer exist to threaten us. And along the way, um, we can create a world of social justice, and a world where the environment um, is protected and respected and we see ourselves as, as part of the living body of earth. With that, I'd like to um, ask Ashley to share the short video that was made by Ari Beezer. Um, I just wanna say before we start this, that um, this is just a way of saying thank you. Um, I'd like to give, um, great homage to my teacher and dear friend, Joanna Macy, who talks about the importance of gratitude um, as a ground note for our work for making the world a more just filled and um, ecologically respected, beautiful place for future generations. So we made this short film as a note of gratitude to everybody who was involved in bringing the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons to the UN. So this is just about two minutes. So after that, uh, I will be very, very happy to take your, your questions or comments. And thank you so very much for uh, joining us here today. Ashley.
Heaven's no protect life on earth. Make way for love in our hearts for our future beings of Description. That was very hopeful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard to find hope sometimes, but that was definitely very hopeful. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for sharing your work with us. Um, for inspiring hope and creativity. And we do have a few minutes for questions and we did have some come out here on the Facebook feed. Um, I'm gonna go to the questions before comments. Um, uh, Susan asked, as the, human, uh, as the Hibaksha age and are less available to come to New York City, even without the pandemic, is Hibaksha stories able to continue relaying their stories? If so, how are you doing this? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I have to say that uh, we have been really focusing on atomic bomb survivor friends that live in North America now, because, you know, if we invite our friends from Japan, they will come. And they're, it's, it's so, it's hard for them to travel. Yes, pre-COVID. What we're working on now are um, we're creating a content rich website so that people can learn about various uh, survivors experiences. We also, as I mentioned, Michi and Miyako are dear colleagues and friends of ours who live in New York that are second generation Hibaksha. So um, looking at how we can use their uh, story and um, conviction so yes, it's harder and harder to get the actual um, atomic bomb survivors into the room. So we're looking to do that through the arts and through second generation survivors. Um, I'd also note that we work with uh, people who have been affected by the US nuclear weapons production. And um, we've been very honored to uh, be joined by Kristen Iverson, who wrote a brilliant book called Full Body Burden. She grew up around Rocky Flats, the plutonium um, manufacturing, pl plutonium pit manufacturing site in Colorado. And so we've had other, um, and Pam Kingfisher, as I mentioned earlier, so other sort of American um, hibaksha. So, that, that's another way forward. Thank you. Oh, are you, you're muted, Tanya. That's that okay. is me just forgetting. Um, okay. So we have more questions. We'll take one more. Um, and then if there are some more up on the feed. And so if you have a chance to go and take a look at them or I can copy them and send them to you, but uh, there's a few more here than we can answer right now. Um, someone, Ann Sheriff writes, thank you for this inspiring presentation for programs such as that in LaGuardia High School, the playwriting workshop, etc. How do the students prepare for the interaction with Hibaksha visitors? To what extent do the students learn about the history of the atomic bombings and the World War II context? Do these programs relate to the high school curricula or are they freestanding? Um, <clears throat> thank you for that question. They are freestanding at the moment. And um, Robert, my beloved collaborator was a New York City public high school teacher. I mean, he's also, I call him an artist of the imagination. Um, you know, he is an, he's also an artist and, and a school teacher um, and he retired. So we had a really good in into the New York City public school system because of Robert. So a lot of the, the teachers who approached us were all already care so much. And I'm very sorry that I didn't include a slide in our um, work at, at the UN because every year we hold a teacher training workshop at the United Nations to um, for a professional development day for teachers. So they come and they learn about um, disarmament education. And so yes, the teachers that are working with us are very enthusiastic. So they do more than the standard curriculum for their students. 
What's very exciting right now is Robert and Michi and others of us in New York City are working on legislation with city council. Um, we're hoping that it's gonna come through soon, but part of that legislation would be to provide a greater uh, curriculum on um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and use the um, testimony witness from Hibakusha that we have gathered through our project. So we hope to have a quote unquote standardized education um, on the nuclear threat today, as well as what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki coming from New York City for all New York City high school students. So we'll keep you posted on that and this very progressive legislation coming through the office of council member Daniel Drom from Jackson Heights in Queens. That's Lane, thank you so much. Um, we'll let you take a look later at questions if you have time. And thanks for sharing your time with us and your oh. great work. And um, I'm looking forward to what's ahead. Thank you so much. I, I have to say how inspired I've been by all the presenters. It's just I I hope we, you know, this time next year, I hope we can all be together. But in the meantime, thank you, Tanya, and everybody that's brought this extraordinary seminar into being. You're welcome.